Richard Trevithick, born in Tregadure on Cornwall in 1771. He became a British mining engineer and inventor. He was first to build a high pressure steam engine and in 1804 he was the first to build a full scale working steam locomotive. But three years earlier, in 1801, Trevithick built a steam engine to be used not on rails, but on the open road. He hoped that one day such engines would come to replace the working horse, which, back in 1801, was about as far-fetched as the notion of a man being able to fly to the moon in a steam-powered balloon. I am, of course, referring to Trevithick's 1801 engine, the Puffing Devil. Although none of Trevithick's original working drawings still exist, in 1998 Philip Hoskin of the Trevithick Society made an appeal on BBC Radio Cornwall for anyone who could help them build a replica of Richard Trevithick's 1801 Puffing Devil to commemorate its bicentenary in 2001. Local farmer and traction engine owner John Saul contacted Philip Hoskin and said I could build it. Well, it's enough to say that under the leadership and dogged determination of John Saul, that over the next few years, this ambitious project took hold and grabbed the hearts, minds and imagination of Cornwall's people, along with the generosity and wherewithal of its business and commercial communities. Well, the written story of the Trevithick 2001 project really does read like a film script. Now, I'm not a steam engineer, and when I build these 3D CGI models of steam engines, they start out as much of a mystery to me as they do to most folk. So, let's take a moment to acquaint ourselves with some of its bits and bobs. Let's begin with the boiler, built by Deepdale Engineering of Dudley. Its length is about 5 foot 9 inches, its overall diameter 4 foot. Water conversion rate, around about 35 gallons per hour. And the working steam pressure, well that's 60 to 100 pounds per square inch, PSI. Now if all this sounds a little bit gobbledygook to you, don't worry, I'll explain it a little bit better later on. And here is the firebox which uses coal as fuel. And this is the inspection hatch which, when the engine is not being used, can be unbolted and removed to let the engineers look inside the boiler during regular maintenance or if they suspect something may be broken inside. The wooden frame chassis is made from oak and was built by David Ball Construction from Redruth. Its length is 12 foot and width 3 foot. David Ball Construction also supplied the oak and ash for the wheels and the wheels were constructed by Robert Herford, a liveryman of the Worshipful Company of Wheelwrights at Hill Farms in Somerset on iron hubs which were cast by Compare UK. Here we have the water feed tank which holds a capacity of 36 gallons. Now, that's interesting to note because the boiler converts 35 gallons of water into steam every hour. Therefore, if we were to set off on a three-hour journey with a full water feed tank, then we're going to have to make two additional water stops. Here we have the water pump. Basically, it pumps water from the water feed tank through the preheater and then into the boiler via the inlet valve. Now, I shall go through this in a little bit more detail shortly. Here we have what looks like one of those old iron bedsteads. A bit of a confusing mass of whatnots and gubbins. So let's jump right in and begin making sense of it all. 
This is the head of the steam piston cylinder and protruding from that is the piston rod. Now the piston rod is firmly connected to the crosshead beam. The crosshead beam slides up and down these two stabilizers which are firmly bolted to the boiler at their base and at their top they are held firmly and securely by a cross brace and two bracing rods which are themselves bolted to the head of the boiler. Also connected to the crosshead beam is the water pump piston rod. We also appear to have a contraption which juts out from the crosshead beam. This is referred to as the tappet, but it looks very much like a plug tree. Finally for this group we have the two connecting rods which link the driving force of the crosshead beam to the wheel hubs. These are made from oak, strengthened by a sandwich of iron straps bolted to their sides. And it's these two iron straps which also help to hold the two brass bushes in place at either end. Now of course, back in 1801, Trevithick was the pioneer of high pressure steam engines and all was in its infancy. Nothing was uniform, standardised, fully understood or regulated by health and safety laws which the team building the replicas of the Puffin Devil had to stringently adhere to in the last decade of the 20th century. Nevertheless, there is a safety feature on today's replicas which goes right back to the days of Trevithick, the lever arm safety valve, which again we'll shortly take a closer look at. And finally for this introductory section, we have the steering arm. Now to steer the puffing devil when in motion, even on today's tarmac roads, requires a degree of brute force and a firm set of dentures. Given the fact it lacks any suspension and is very basic in design. Now to assist the steersman from losing control of the arm, the arm has been made to slide along the front rail bar and also has sturdy wood movable pegs to act as stops. I have to say I'm in awe of Trevithick and his fellow pioneering engineers of the time. Here they were building machines for which the technology and the machines to build them didn't yet exist. In their day and age Everything counted on the skills, experience and sheer ingenuity of the visionary engineer and the people he was working with to make round rivets fit square holes and to form complex shapes in iron which are both watertight and fit for purpose. In this next section we shall delve into the belly of the beast and discover how the puffing devil worked. But first let me just say I'll be pulling snippets of information from this book about the life of Richard Trevithick which is entitled Genius and was written by Philip Hoskin, a worthwhile addition to anyone's personal library. When we enter the belly of the beast, what we find are two primary components, the combined firebox and flue and the piston cylinder. Looking at the combined firebox and flue in isolation, we can see it's a U-shaped cylinder which is wider at the firebox end than it is at the end which connects to the chimney stack. And here is a photograph of the same component manufactured in the mid 1990s. Notice how all the different segments are welded to a very high standard. Now take a look at how Trevithick had to build his with nothing more than rivets. This is engineering at its most basic and yet 
at its very best, as this had to be watertight even under the extreme pressures within the boiler itself. Also notice on the first plate of Trevithick's firebox and flue, the holes are square, not round. Heavy duty mechanical pillar drills were a thing of the future. The holes on Trevithick's engines were chiselled out by hand. Next, we'll take a look at the piston cylinder. I think it's best if we explore this in isolation. Here we can see the piston cylinder already in cross section and we've also included the tappet or plug tree as it is an important part of the piston's operation as we shall soon discover. Inside the piston cylinder attached to the piston rod are two piston heads. Each piston head has a face side and it's the face of the piston head which is pushed by the force of the active steam pressure. Situated at both the head and the base of the piston cylinder is a hole or steam port which allows the alternating flow of active and exhaust steam to enter and exit that part of the piston cylinder. Let's now explore the mechanics which govern the alternating directional flow of the active and exhaust steam. Sandwiched and locked into place by these two flange plates is this metal block. Now it is important to note that I've recreated this model based on drawings of Trevithick static engine whereas the piston cylinder for the replica was cast using the latest technology available back in the 1990s and for which I didn't have access to the drawings. Nevertheless, the operating principles remain the same. Looking at the valve block on its own, we can see that it is shaped and designed to fit tight up close to the side of the piston cylinder and it contains various holes and recesses. We'll return to the valve block in a moment, but first I want you to see the valve itself. Here it is. It's a cylinder with two grooves running across its width on opposite sides of each other. And the valve rotates on its axis about 90 degrees backwards and forwards. And here we can see it in action. I'll freeze frame here for a moment as it's a good place to point out the locations of the steam ports. Let's start with the primary steam inlet port. This comes up through the bottom flange plate and it's external to the piston cylinder. Pressurised steam enters here directly from the boiler. The steam port for the base of the piston cylinder, it's simply a pipe which lets active steam go down to the base of the piston cylinder and also serves as the exit route for the exhaust steam. And it's the same situation for the steam port which serves the head of the piston cylinder. Okay, so they are the key components associated with the alternating valve block. But let's now look at the shape of the spaces within the block. Just to remind ourselves, this valve block is fitted tightly into place against the outer casing of the piston cylinder and the active steam inlet port is outside of the cylinder as can be seen 
as we look at the block from the back. Viewing the valve block from the front, we can now see that we have an active steam feed into the central cylinder, a feed to the head of the piston cylinder, a feed to the base of the piston cylinder, and an exhaust outlet. We'll introduce the alternating cylindrical valve and let's have that in cross section also. Then we can see the position of the two grooves as it rotates alternately through 90 degrees. So when the valve's grooves are in this position then active steam is fed into the head of the piston cylinder and exhaust steam is forced up from the base of the piston cylinder and out through the exhaust outlet. Rotate the valve back 90 degrees and now the configuration has changed to allow active steam to be fed down to the base of the piston cylinder as exhaust steam is expelled from the head of the piston cylinder and out of the exhaust outlet. Now how simple and sweet is that bit of engineering? Staying with the valve block a little longer, I now want to explain the purpose of this hole here. As we can see, it joins up with the primary steam inlet port. Now its purpose is to simply house the valve that lets us stop the steam from the boiler entering the valve block unit until we need it to power the puffing devil. Here in this cutaway we can see the valve in question. Steam flow off, steam flow on, off, on. Now we don't need to keep turning it off and on like this. We turn the steam on and leave it on for as long as we need the puffing devil to move. It was whilst I was working on the graphics of the last section that a question suddenly popped into my head. Once we've turned on the open valve for the primary steam inlet port, how do we know if the rear drive wheels of the puffing devil are going to move forward? Or in reverse. Hmm. Prior to turning on the active steam floor to the valve block, the engine driver has to decide which position the valve should be in. Let's say position H sends the active steam to the head of the piston cylinder and position B sends the active steam to the base of the piston cylinder. Using this simplified animation of the rear wheels and the two piston heads connected to the piston rod, I want to set the motion of the puffing devil in this direction. So the question is, do I direct active steam to the head of the piston cylinder by selecting option or position H, or do I need to send active steam to the base by selecting option or position B? With the rear wheels and the connecting rods in this position, then I need to choose position B in order to force the piston upwards to begin the motion. However, if the wheels and the connecting rods are in this position, and I want to go in the same direction, then would I be correct in selecting position B to send active steam to the base of the piston cylinder? Hmm. I'll let you work that one out. We're almost done with the piston cylinder and valve. Now, I may be overthinking this, but it does seem to me as though there are two ideal positions for the drive wheels and connecting rods to be in before the active steam is sent powering off into the piston cylinder. Let me explain. If we think of the drive wheel and connecting rod as a clock face with 12 o'clock at the top, and let's say I want to move in this direction, then I need to send active steam to the head of the cylinder to force the piston down. But in this position, the drive wheel could kick this way, that way, or the connecting rod could be forced off its connection with the drive wheel altogether. 
And the same would be true if the driving wheel and connecting rods were in the six o'clock position. So it seems to me that nine o'clock or three o'clock are the best positions to start off from. What do you think? Right, well I've got my drive wheels and connecting rods in the nine o'clock position. I've set my piston valve to the B position to send active steam to the base of the piston in order to force the piston upwards. So now all I need to do is open up the active steam inlet valve and we're off. Now we're not going far on this little jaunt. In fact, I only want to show you how the tappet or plug tree works with the piston cylinder valve. Now I don't think I need to spend too much time explaining how this works. If you've watched my other video on Newcomen's atmospheric engine, I do mention that originally a plugman, now plugs were the names of taps or valves in the old days, would manually operate these, but that proved unworkable. So Newcomen found a way to automate this process and he invented a plug tree which was attached to the main beam. Well, this is basically the same. It's attached to the overhead beam, and once you set the piston in motion, this taps the semi-cogged lever up and down through its cycle, which in turn changes the direction of the piston valve. For this final section of our tour of the Puffing Devil, we're simply going to add water and bring to the boil, and then we'll cover the parts which are best examined whilst in operation. First we shall remove the square head brass plug from the inspection hatch, and then we'll get the water line in and fill a boiler up. On the replica Puffing Devil, these two brass taps are purely cosmetic, but in Trevithick's day, he would have used these to gauge the lower and upper levels of the water required. But today they use a modern water level gauge. Once filled to the required level, we replace the brass plug and then we set about getting a fire going. And as we need to raise a head of steam of between 60 and 100 pounds per square inch PSI within the boiler, it may be a good idea if we close the fire hatch. Whilst waiting to generate some steam pressure, the air draw within the fire box and throughout the flue can be, well, a little bit sluggish. Now that doesn't help to spread the heat from the fire to the rest of the flue, which is basically a heating element within the boiler. So we need to generate more air draw, and that's where this valve tap connected to the inspection hatch can help us out. Leading from it is a pipe which then feeds into the chimney stack. Now if we look inside the chimney stack we can see its open end is pointing upwards. Opening the valve's tap sends a blast of pressurized steam up the chimney and creates an air draw that pulls the heat throughout the flue. Even from the early days of steam, ways were sought and means invented to maintain an accurate and safe level of steam at all times. After all, when these boilers failed and exploded, they had deadly consequences. In 1803, at Greenwich, one of Trevithick's stationary engines exploded, killing four men. The incident was highlighted and ruthlessly exploited by Trevithick's rival, James Watt. Following the explosion, Trevithick then fitted two safety valves to all his engines, but in 1801 Trevithick only used the lever arm safety valve which used a counterbalanced weight to apply a variable amount of force down onto a piston valve. Let me explain. Here we have a lever arm, which is firmly fixed to this pivot point. Now, connected to this arm is a safety valve piston, 
which, if we take a look at this simple diagram, we can see that it acts as a plug to stop the steam from escaping. All the while, inside the boiler, we're building up steam pressure. Now, if we don't have a weight at this end, this plug would be pushed up at less than five pounds per square inch and steam would be constantly escaping, which isn't going to provide us with the 60 to 100 pounds per square inch of steam we need to work the engine. This is 1801, just two years before we begin the sporadic war with France and Napoleon. So, there's still a few cannonballs lying around. Now, we could get one of those and modify it and use that as a weight. But wait a moment. Now, I know I can get a cannonball that's just over six and a half inches in diameter, but, well, it's only going to weigh 42 pounds. So if I was to place this right on top of the safety valve, using it as a dead weight, then it's still not going to be enough for me to build up any steam pressure above that of 42 pounds. But strange things begin to happen when we place the cannonball weight on the end of the arm lever. At its furthest extent of the lever arm, our 42 pound weight now exerts a downward force of about 105 pounds on the safety valve. Now this value reduces back down to 42 pounds as we move the weight closer to the valve itself. So, by positioning the weight between these two points, we could vary the force being applied to the valve from between 63 pounds to 105 pounds which would suit our requirements nicely if this were a fixed stationary engine and not one destined for the open road. Now I wonder if you could work out why. Oh, and by the way, the math involved with the lever arm safety valve is very interesting in itself. Having built up sufficient steam pressure, we've set the puffing devil in motion and turned off the steam valve from the inspection hatch which has been producing a decent airflow for us. Now that the main piston is working, the exhausting from it can be used in a couple of different ways to our advantage. The exhaust steam has been piped and rerouted into the chimney stack as we can see in the cutaway. And it's this exhaust steam which now produces the air draw as we're on the move. With scalding hot steam flowing through the exhaust pipe, it becomes extremely hot and by feeding it through a hollow outer cylinder, as we can see here in cutaway, we can use that heat to preheat the water from the external water feed tank before it's eventually pumped into the boiler. However, we do have a slight anomaly with regards to this pumping system. Do you recall, I stated that the feeder tank has a capacity of 36 gallons and that the boiler's water to steam conversion rate is 35 gallons per hour. Well, the pump, being fixed to the cross beam and permanently pumping water for as long as the engine is working, does so at a rate of 116 gallons per hour. Oh. At that rate, we would be attempting to pump the volume of three full water feed tanks worth of water into the boiler every hour, which just isn't going to happen. The solution is fairly simple. We have the pump outlet pipe feed into a T-junction, one end of which leads into the preheater cylinder, whilst the other end has a tap, which, when opened, redirects the water back into the feeder tank. Now when the boiler is getting low on water, we simply close this tap and then the water heads off into the preheater and then into the boiler. Once the boiler is full, turn on the tap again.
And that brings this brief tour of Trevithick's pub in Devil Steam Engine to a close. Richard did take it out for a drive, but I'll let you find out what happened there. Now the people of Cornwall have good reason to be proud of one of their early pioneering sons, cos I'll tell thee summat, he'd a made a right cracking Yorkshireman. Well, hope you enjoyed, and I'll catch you later.